recording today's session. Good morning. I am Cami Nair with NCDPI for the NISA system. I've managed that product for you. And thank you all for joining us today. We had um, over 30, I think, signed up. So we may have, still have some folks coming in. Um, if you'll check your chat, there are some links there to today's opening slides and to the sign in. Please, it's very important that you sign in today. And then links we will use for thesis in just a few minutes. So I'd like to introduce my um, supervisor, Dr. Rob Dietrich. So he's going to um, go through our opening session today. Good morning, Rob. Hey, good morning, everybody. I hope you are having a wonderful Monday. Uh, we thank you for joining our last April home based meetup for the year. Always lots of good information on on these, especially the last one. We start talking about ending of the year and it seems like we started just yesterday. Uh, but it has flown by this year specifically uh, for lots of different reasons. Please, you see the slides there for the opening meeting. You see there is our Webex. There you have all the reminders and remember captions are now available in the left corner. You should see that symbol to where you could get closed captioning. Uh, which will help as well. If you have questions, please share them in the QA or in the chat. The purpose of these are to foster a positive experience. I think these are some of the most important meetings we have all year. And we want you to come to these and be a part and give us your feedback. We are here for you. Next slide, please. There are all the links for the um, home based meetups this week. You have today, NESIS, tomorrow, SchoolNet. You get a double dose on Wednesday, powerschoollearning.com. You get Canvas on Thursday, and on Friday, you get Go Open. And again, we welcome you to come to these and learn as much as you can about these products and how they can help you in your classrooms and in your PSUs. Next slide, please. And this is new and improved for next year. There are the home base dates that we have set up for next year. So please mark your calendars down. We are going to make sure we have one in July. It will be virtual. And if you will notice, there is some normal, some normalcy coming back to the world. We are going to try to be in person in September, November, and May with a full virtual in February, as has happened with many times and it would have happened again this year had we been on the road. The weather in February tends to be so sporadic that it just makes sense for us to do a virtual in February, and we will do one this summer. But again, we are looking forward to getting back out there. I will have locations for you. Um, hopefully by July, we'll have locations for you so you will know where we're going in September, November, and May. And you will see we're gonna move west to east in September east to west in November and west to east in May. So we are very glad. Um, I know for all of us on the home base side, we can't wait to get back out and see you again. So we are looking forward to it. Next slide, please. There are the slide decks that you can view and see for the upcoming meetings that we have this week. This is always a good place to go and click on it as Cami just did. You can go and see the slide decks that are there. Next slide, please. There's all our hashtags, call signs, and all those things that make us out there in the digital world. So please make sure to look at our Did You Knows and follow us on Facebook and like us so that you can be up to speed with everything we're doing. Next slide, please. And there is the wonderful home base team. Uh, really, I don't think they need any introduction. We are, we, we do, what I believe is a good job trying to assist you and help you and get you the information you need. I do think Cami does an outstanding job with Nisus and, and working with Robert Sox as well, who I, I guess is probably a temporary member of our team as much as we are a temporary member of his team because we work together to make it all happen. But we're very grateful to be here with you today. We're very grateful to the work that you're doing out there. We look forward to having a good, strong end of year. And we hope that, uh, we will see you soon in the coming months. Thank you. Appreciate it, Cammie. Thank you, Rob. All right, before we get off this slide, and this will be at the end of the NISA slides, also is um, I want to mention the feedback at the end of the session. Please do fill that out, um, especially you will get training for one hour today. And if you use those CEUs um, and you fill out this feedback, you'll get a link to a certificate for today.
All right, and this is your session, so feel free to unmute. Feel free to use your chat to enter any questions. Um, that's usually where we'll watch. Um, I'll open the Q&A just in case somebody puts a question there. But if you like, please just put it in the chat. And um, be sure to select everyone as if it's a question that will apply to most everyone. Uh, you can message people individually as well, or just message um, the host and the co-host. And I'll put the links in the chat one more time. And just remind you one more time, if you just have joined us, to please sign in today. And there's the links to the NISA slides that we're getting started with right now. So at any time, if you have a question or a comment, or raise your hand if, if maybe we've muted you when you came in, you may, um, you should be able to unmute in our meetings, but. All right, so we're ready to get started. Um, so we're gonna, we just did the opening slides. And so I do want to welcome you again uh, to the NISA's part portion of this uh, meeting today. And then later today, we'll have the 60 minutes of training uh, with Sean Vare. He's gonna uh, focus on some end of year reports including how to use your staff groups and staff dashboards for end of year reporting. And he is also going to focus on building out a doc report um, for those summative evaluations. And then we'll also leave some additional time, hopefully at the end, um, for networking for you to have more time to network. Here is your advisory board committee. Uh, this is a great group. We have Angela from Granville, Sherry from Guilford, Erica from Chapel Hill, Carlborough City, Brian um, from Buncombe, and Dean from Alamance, Burlington. Um, they bring your um, concerns and kudos to our advisory committee every quarter. So if you have any input or want to know what happened at the last advisory meeting, um, these are your contacts. And if you've not joined our NISA's email Google group, this is your network group. It's managed by Brian Probst with Bumpkin County and Sally Reynolds with Blake County. Robert uh, Sox and I um, do look in on that and we only jump in as needed. You guys are awesome at responding to each other whenever you have questions. So please post those questions there and you'll get your answers. So now it's time for our usual Padlet activity, and here is the link. It was also entered into the chat. So I'm going to give you maybe about five minutes to please come out here. Uh, if you're new with us, um, and we have over 30, so we haven't introduced everybody today. Um, but if you'd like to say hi under good news to share, please do so today. Um, then please list any successes you've had since our February meet up, any challenges that have been going on since February. Um, we had a couple of suggestions for networking time and that was end of year and the TNL, the HRMS credit transfer process. Anything else, any tips you have for people for the end of uh, year, please add those in the fourth column. And then I'll keep up with the DPI actions in the last column. So I'm just gonna go quiet for a few minutes and let you fill that out. All right, y'all keep filling out. I just want to also let you know, if you see a, a tab or a note that you like, you can heart it, and you can also add your comments. Uh, if you have a similar comment, you just want to add to somebody else's comment, you can add a comment to their um, little note there.
So I would like to ask probably give you guys just one more minute to fill out the form here, the Padlet. Do we have anybody new joining us today? If you'd unmute and introduce yourself and where you're from. Or raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, and good morning, everyone. My name is Corey Tyler. I'm uh, in Northampton County. I'm the technology director. I also do power school and uh, media. Um, I'm, I'm fairly new to it. And um, just like I said, trying to add to my bag of tricks to um, just listen in and pretty much get a good idea of what's going on. Hey, Corey. Nice to have you here today. Thank you. Anybody else new today? Okay, we'll get started. I'm reading our notes. We're going to start with the good news to share. Uh, if you'd like to unmute and talk about your note, please do. Um, the first one is got my shots. And everybody's been vaccinated. That's great. Yes. I know that's been a goal for a whole lot of folks. All right, we got one. Um, I'm new at this. Um, that might have been a Corey comment right there. Um, there might be a couple of other new ones out there. So, yes, we're all here for you. So, if you have any questions, um, just reach out to us at DPI and your um, peers here today. There's a good morning and a welcome to our new members. Somebody's uh, got a son having a birthday today. Congratulations on that. Happy birthday. Um, how old is he today? Anybody want to unmute and let us know? Amy, that was me. He's six today. Oh, hey, Rob. I should have known that one. I've seen it on Facebook. <laughs> Happy birthday. And Lindsay, looks like you're having a beautiful day in Charlotte. It is gorgeous here. I hope it's gorgeous there, too. It is pretty. I haven't had a chance really to get outside, but it looks pretty out my window. All right, does anybody else want to unmute for just a minute and say hi? We're good right now. All right, we're going to move on to our successes column. Um, the staff evaluation page column has labels for active plan, et cetera, and they're so much more clear. Um, yes, and we do have a slide showing that if you missed that announcement. Um, we did uh, listen to you guys and try to make it even more clear on that page so your principals, when they go to the staff evaluation page, they would make the connection of what's happening on the My Staff page to the staff evaluations page. Our admin teams are meeting NISA's deadlines. That's awesome when people are meeting their calendar deadlines. Um, that's, that speaks to um, the good leadership and then that they are keeping up with that. That's awesome. GP status reports. Yes, I really like that report. We will look at those today as well. Um, they are showing you percentages at a school level. So I'm glad that you guys are liking that. All right, anybody else have a success before we move on? Okay, let's get into some challenges. Mentors and PDPs. Um, we're interested in hearing how other districts are monitoring mentor signatures on BDPs. Even with the reminders in NESIS, which I appreciate, we still have a few sites that overlook this requirement. Does anybody have some help for this person? How do you handle um, that and making sure those mentor signatures are in place on the required plans? And I believe this is for your beginning teachers. Excuse me, I, I run a report that shows all the comprehensive people mm -hmm. and then I bounce it against the PDP and I send a report that if they've not had the mentor sign, I mark it that the mentor signature is required. Also, when I do it, I also put it for the end of year review so that they know everyone has to have a signature. And put it out for the... Put it out for the administrators. That's good. Anybody else? Thank you, Sherry. Good morning, everybody. It's Eleanor and Charlotte. Hey, Eleanor. Hey. 
Um, we work really closely with our professional development team. Um, they do a lot of the direct work with our um, supporting our mentor contacts um, at each school and then um, supporting the mentors directly and then also our beginning teachers. So they're running professional development and can also remind them of the process requirements, including getting those signatures. So that has worked out really well to have that partnership and that um, additional way to get information both to the beginning teachers and to the uh, mentors and mentor contacts at the school level. Thank you, Eleanor. That's good points from both Eleanor and Sherry. So that's a good way to do that. Have somebody else follow up on that. All right, anybody else before we move on? Okay, peer observations again, we tried again this year to have people review their plan types. But no matter what we do, there is wailing and catching of teeth that the peer observation is required on the comprehensive plan. Yeah, it's Eleanor. This is me again. There, there's nothing we can do about this unless there's a way to have some sort of override on the comprehensive plan in order to say, you know, it's been reviewed and turns out this is not actually required for this person. Right. But um, just just venting. I'm That's sure okay. we're all doing this. So what do you do with that peer observation? I know some that will go in there and they'll just mark not look for and make sure that they put some very descriptive notes as to why they marked those not look for on the peer. If it's for somebody that has a comprehensive plan, it's not required to have a comprehensive plan if, because they're being a teacher. Yeah. All right. Anybody else have any comments about that? All right. All right. So it looks like we have a DPI action item feature state. Looking forward to hearing what is planned at the North Carolina DPI level. Is that for NESIS or just overall for home base? Hey, it's Eleanor. It's me again. Mm -hmm. Um just always interested to hear as soon as possible kind of what's what's coming up, particularly with the modernization um, project mm -hmm. going on and uh, opportunities for enhancements or upgrades. Okay. Um, yeah, as far as NISIS, um, I will say that we have thoroughly looked and have wanted to upgrade the NISIS system, um, but the timing now and with everything else going on with modernization, that may not be the thing to do to throw at everybody at one time. Most everybody is very comfortable in NISIS right now. Um, so probably our goal is just to keep um, doing the small updates in the current system we have, but also focusing on when can we get to that, the new forms in NISIS. So do know that we have that a high priority to um, get the NISIS, form, NISIS system upgraded as soon as we can. Uh, and then overall, um, I believe there'll be some communication going out. I do have a slide today about modernization. Somebody did ask about that at our last H HBMU. Okay, I don't see any other. Let me scroll back through these other ones. I think we're good um, and we're ready to move on. Thank you guys. All right, we're going to get into our NISIS updates that have happened. So here are our February Padlet questions that we said we would go back and find some answers for you for. Um, the February pilot, somebody asked, is anyone else switching to Tyler? And you know, you've got a choice between Tyler and Cherry Road and somebody had answered uh, um, Elements Burlington is, but they're early in the process. They're, they're on the right, you're gonna find some links to school business systems modernization. The first link is to the DPI webpage. And then there was another link within there to the LEA ERP modernization site. And I did speak with Dr. Spano this morning. They are updating the list as to who all is going with Tyler and who all is going with Cherry Road. It may not be updated right now, but they are working on that today. So your contact there would be Dr. Spano, Michael Spano, um, for any modernization updates. So do um, bookmark those sites. Um, we are very interested in what is next. I do know that they are testing out how this is going to affect NISIS. Um, and so far, as long as everything goes through and gets uploaded to staff UID correctly, um, NISIS will be fine. 
Um, they are working on one last piece with the roll piece with the budget codes coming over to staff UID, but they um, said that that was in the final stages of working, so that should be set directly. Um, so do keep an eye on that, and we will, We are keeping an eye on that because we want our NISA's data to remain viable. Any, any questions about that? I'm just looking, we'll see Eleanor put a comment in the chat, or Sally did. Um, Sally had a comment in the chat about the peers, uh, and it was sent to everyone if you want to read that on how Wake County handles the peer observations. Rainy teachers may have a comprehensive plan, but should have standard plan. Um, principal can assign an administrator to the peer observer and mark everything not looked for. So yes, that's, we had mentioned that earlier. So thank you, Sally. All right, the next public question we had from February is, is there a report that shows staff members whose evaluation rubric type have not been set? Um, so the district administrators can create an ad hoc people report. That's the only report I know that will pull um, what has been set on the My Staff page. And when you go out there, um, you must be a district administrator to create an ad hoc report. Um, a NISA's district administrator, so you must have that access right. And then when you create the people report, look for the PDP type and the teacher plan type and make sure you check on the left for them to show on your report and just leave equals and then just leave it on the blank and it should pull all the different plan types that are set and leave blanks for those that have not been set. I did link how to create the ad hoc reporting basics up there on the right. Question three was DBI course 18183 is set to DLC credit type and it should not be. Um, so this was somebody who felt this course did not meet the DLCs. Uh, so we did take that back to the group that created the course and that was our integrated academic and behavior systems at DBI. And you can always see who created the course by looking in the course notes when you're searching for a course or when it's on somebody's transcript, you can look at their transcript and see what office the course was created in, and then reach out to your DPI contact that is in that division. So the answer we got back is a, they've linked a couple um, documents here that support why they feel this course does meet DLC credits. And DPI does, for the general most part, set their credit types on their courses to general. But again, it's up to them what credit type they set in their department. So they can set it to DLC. And they probably did because so many people are looking for those um, courses that do offer DLC credits. You always have the option to approve it to be something else at the district level, at the PSU level. And if you ever want somebody to update it on the NISA's transcript, I've linked the help guide for how to do that. And that has to also be somebody with NISA's district administrator rights. So that's optional at your district level. You do not have to update the NISA's transcript to show a change of, of approval, but you can. All right, question number four was sometimes instructors need to see which sections teachers register for. It would be nice if they could run a report for this. I have tried publishing one to them, but they don't have reporting rights. That's correct. Uh, is teachers, user level people in NISAs do not have rights to reporting. Even if you published a report, you can't really publish a report to users because they don't have rights to reporting. So that's correct. But your instructors can run the view roster enrollment history report. It is a fantastic report and it's found in the view roster portion of the course. So everybody that has been assigned an instructor on a course has a channel called Courses I'm Teaching on the My Courses page. And they can search for all their courses, current courses and past, I believe. So they would click on the course title to get to the roster, click on the course title, scroll down to the section. Uh, usually it is an instructor-led course, so you would scroll down to the section and then click on View Roster and select the enrollment history button. And then there's a little screenshot on the right on what that looks like. 
you can see what actions were taken, people, when people were added to the course, when they were updated on the course, and who did it. And then what status was happening at that time when they were added, they were marked as registered. Here's somebody that was updated and they were marked completed. And I'm going to give you the date and the time as well. So if they're looking for people that are signing up for the course that they're teaching, they can go to the view roster. They can also get to that. They have an instructor tab link at the top of the page of the NISA site. They can go there and click on the course titles. Or if they're looking at past, they, they have a little icon they can click on to also get to this view roster. Any questions about that? All right, and then observation time. I wish there was a way to get people to put time in uniformly so that Excel can calculate times easily. Um, this is something we have brought up with the vendor support with PowerSchool, and it will have to be a feature enhancement to the system. So on the right, you can see over there the container where they enter their observation start times, and they get that container when they start new in observation. It pops up. And so they have to manually enter the times and you can see they have a widget for the calendar, but not for the times. So we are asking PowerSchool either to add a widget or add a force format to these containers. Because you can see when you run your quick report for observation starting in times there in the middle graphic. There is the results of that shown down below and you can see all the different ways that people put in times. And so NISA's, uh, NISA's Excel, when you export it to Excel, it's going to have a hard time without you manually formatting all those times to be similar. Okay, so before we move on, let me see if we have any questions in the chat. Looks like we're good. So we are getting ready finally to get our NISIS user group guiding effective thriving stakeholders, and that's narrowed down to nuggets. Um, so you guys are our NISIS Nuggets, and you guys, um, you can see on the screen here who we have 10 uh, different districts that have chosen and volunteered to participate. They will be our group that will run by anything that's coming up, new in the system, uh, review vendor updates, um, maybe pilot and provide feedback, and then communicate what we've worked on to the rest of the state. So here um, you can see we have Rhonda Davis from Brunswick County, Megan McNutt from Cabarrus, Cherry Thomas from Guilford, Lori Stacy from Person County, Angela Martin from Rockingham County, Sally Reynolds from Wake County, Brian Prokes from Buncombe County, Keisha White from the Paul R. Brown Leadership Academy Charter School, and Ethan Burton from Southern Wake Academy, and Brian Mathis from, I believe that is, I can't see because I have my captions here. Advanced Charter School. Brian, you can uh, uh, unmute and tell me differently. Um, but thank you so much, guys. Um, we will be sending out an email this week to find a common time to meet, hopefully next week. <laughs> we do need some Nuggets t-shirts. <laughs> that sounds good, Sally. I like that. So, yeah, we like our little um, um, name. So I think that would make a cool t-shirt. We'll have to come up with some good designs. <laughs> we could definitely do that. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks again to you, that group. So moving forward, um, we will be piloting a new principal rubric for the 2021-22 school year. We are currently working with the vendor to get that rubric. Robert has given them the new rubric and hopefully we'll get moving forward with the vendor to create that in the system. We'll get it all tested and we'll also be selecting pilots shortly with um, Dr. Sox. Um, so if we reach out to you and to our Nisus Nuggets group, um, I think we'll get enough pilot to pilot this in the fall. The original principal rubric will be available. So the pilot groups will have a choice. Um, and we haven't decided um, when we get with our group exactly how to pilot that out. Will they be able to have different people on the rubric or do they just want everybody on the new rubric? So we'll look at that as we move forward and discuss it some more. Any questions about the new principal rubric for the fall? Uh, this one is getting communicated out today. Um, 
if you guys let me know who else to communicate this out to, because this is next week. Uh, Premium Library, we're going to hold some webinars uh, as far as um, implementing this into all the districts. And then they can choose if they want to use the Premium Library. And of course, that's where you can go out. We have um, four vendors, I believe, that are offering paid for courses and some free courses that you can purchase by the seat. And so the webinars are going to be held May um, 10th, and that's a Monday from 2 to 3 p.m. And then it's going to be repeated May 12th from 10 to 11. So you have a choice on which session you'd like to join if you want to hear some more information about that. I was reading the comments. And <laughs> Thank you, Eleanor, for the 10 piece nuggets and no charge for the spicy sauce. <laughs> All right, so if you have any questions about Premium Library, um, please email me or Dr. Summers, and um, we'll get those answered for you if you don't have any here today. I just left this slide in here to let you know I'm still working um, with some counties on the HR data that shows up in NESIS. A lot of this has to be cleaned up on the district side. Um, if you're using HRMS or Link HR, they are already sending these classification codes on your staff to DPI. You just have to make sure that you've given them updates on your staff. So if your staff is no longer a beginning teacher, they're going to need a different code than what they had three or four years ago. So make sure that you're giving them the correct codes. Um, if you are manually, if you're like a charter and you don't have HRMS or Link HR, um, you can manually upload this to DPI, and this link document tells you how to do that. Any questions about HR data? This shows in demographics and shows on reports, and teachers do get concerned sometimes if they're standard or abbreviated and their demographics are saying they're comprehensive. Tammy, did we ever figure out where from HRMS this was pulling from? Where? Uh -huh. Which date in HRMS this was pulling from? The classification code data? Uh -huh. um, I have to check on that. Let me write that down on my notes. Okay. <laughs> I'm racking my brain like, did we find that out? <laughs> All right, let me check on that here. Okay. I think I did Thank you. Ask, but let me find that out and I'll make sure to I'll follow up with everybody on that. Thank you. All right, so if you missed our NESIS webinars, um, we have pretty much completed for the year. But if you have any ideas that you would like to see out there, Kim and I are always glad to see what we can put together for you for the remainder of the year. We did do our end of year um, webinars in March, and you see the links there at the bottom of the screen on the left. And then those of you that are still um, getting ready to do the summative evaluations, we held a webinar in March as well, and the recording and presentation are there. Um, last week or the week before, Kim did the peer observation webinar, and it was very well received. This, I know it was too late for some of you this year, but a lot of you are still getting ready to do those peer observations. Um, so please do go out there and watch this. We had tons of positive comments on this. And then you can also use this over the summer to train your peers uh, on the peer evaluation. So there's just a comment up there. They like that the presentation offered the knowledge behind the ratings and also pro provided updates to the current observation form so that they know that during uh, peer observations, they're using the knowledge, action, interaction, and extension and not rating the staff. They're helping them grow with knowledge, action, interaction, and extension. All right, let's look at what's new since February. And we have some new uh, export reports and help guides here. So I've added under system report exports, the manage and scheduling of quick reports um, help guide how to export a plan to PDF help guide, and then an ad hoc reports, how to schedule and export an ad hoc reports help guide. So check those out. Any questions about those?
Here's the new um, GP status report is your um, evaluation process current year report. And this is um, really cool. Um, I could go to the, anybody want to see this one in the lab side? So we can, you can go to reporting. Um, just let me know in the comments if you want to see this slide. You can go to reporting and then the very first choice that comes up is the evaluation process current year. And then under that, you can select the GP status. Yes, please. All right, so let me be a site administrator. So I'm in NISAs. I'm going to go get one of my test people. Show you how that report works. This can be run by district administrators or site administrators. It does only return school level um, numbers and percentages. It doesn't really give an overall percentage for district wide, but it is very cool to see the school numbers. Okay, so now I'm a site administrator, and this is your principals or your APs who've been given site administrators. They do now have access to reporting. And here you see that the very first report that comes up when I navigate here is the evaluation process current year. So leave it on that. And then the only choice you have is the GP status. So then you click next. Excuse me. <clears throat> so if you're a district administrator, you would see district and school or the entity here. And you would select one or the other. And then you can select individual schools here as well. I hope I got somebody who has some schools. Let's see what it is. That is not working. Let me stop. I'm just going to go show you guys myself. Okay, so I am a super user, so I am going to have some additional links here. So we're going to put this on school. And North Carolina. All right, and then you can see you can drill down into your schools and I'm not going to show any people information in this, but this is going to show you an overall percentage. So let's do next. And then you have a choice on what plan to look at. So I'm just going to look at maybe our um, comprehensive plans. Um, Watch the dates out here. They've already enabled my test plans for 21 22. So that is showing up on some of your screens. Um, make sure you choose the current year. And then click next. And then click done. All right, and so now you see your report for the comprehensive plan right here. You can look at the overall, the number of participants was three that are on the comprehensive plan at this uh, school and nobody has started their plan. So that's a good information for you. Um, if you want to know who has not started a plan, you can click on the school name on the left and it will give you individual names. You can click into each one of these items here so if you just wanted a quick view of who um, was not started, who was in progress and who was complete, then this gives you not only the number of people, but the percentage of people in each area. So you have your overall numbers up here in the gray, 
and then you can click down into each of these activities to get how many have completed observation one. So Deborah, I hope that helps. Uh, all these places you can open up. And then at the very top, if you open up the overall, um, then it opens up all the containers. There is a PDF icon over here. You can print it, but it doesn't print the expanded version. It only like prints this overall number that shows the percentages at the top. You're welcome, Deborah. Okay. And here's how it looks if you were to see the blue for in progress and the green for complete. I've also created a quick resource video that you see linked here on the left um, for your site administrators. Complete at the top does not mean locked, correct? Um, sadly, I haven't tested that out, but that is probably correct as long as the activity is complete. Um, this doesn't show <clears throat> what is locked, I believe. Um, we'd have to go back and look and see if locked is one of the activities um, that shows a percentage on it. I'll follow up on that one as well but to see about the lock portion. That may be something that they can enable. We'll look at that. All right, so 1044. Um, I know um, our Sean Bear will be joining us directly, and I know I want to give him time to do his training. And so cleaning up your unnecessary plans, active plans, um, was put out in our newsletter a couple of weeks ago. This is where we've updated to help you um, on the staff evaluations page you see in the red box. Um, you can view people's active plans and then what rubric uh, are they using? And that comes from my staff. That is assigned on the my staff page. So I get to the next slide. Here's a graphic. Um, to show you what that looks like, here's somebody with three active plans. They have a PDP, which is using the teacher standard rubric. They have an abbreviated evaluation and a standard evaluation, and they should they have been assigned a standard rubric. So which one of these plans is correct? Either A, they should not be in the abbreviated plan, or um, B, they should not be in the standard plan, but you need to fix what's on the My Staff rubric as well to say teacher abbreviated. Okay, any questions about that? And I see Sally, you did go check, and if you click on observation, there is a locked line. Good. So we'll make sure that it does return percentages. Okay. Also on staff evaluations, um, we had a district that was looking for their virtual academy by adding a filter. You can always add filters on your all evaluations page. And they were setting the location and they wanted to pull just and see only their virtual academy. Well, we have several schools in North Carolina with the name virtual in it. And the virtual academy for Winston-Salem Forsyth was not showing up. So this was just fixed this weekend and now they can select their school. So if you if you have any other schools that you can't filter for, please let me know. We'll make sure that it, this is completely fixed. Now this was fixed this weekend. On the right, I've linked what else went out this weekend. The only other major thing in this release that affected North Carolina was if you are a group that uses and creates PD in your PD office in NESIS, and you also align standards to that PD, it was not loading. It was taking either timing out or taking 20, 30 minutes to load the standards. And this has now been corrected. Created some new PD resources for those of you using PD. There's a quick video out there on how to find PD. These are all things that you can share with your staff. Then uh, documents for how to access the home-based PD system in NESIS how to manage courses once you've searched for them and found them, then how do you manage them? There's a document for that. And then we always get questions on, I can't find my transcript or my certificate. Here's your document on how to access your transcript and certificate. And then here's a list of published NCDPI self-paced courses. Um, this will be updated this week. Um, I did get notice from NCBPS that they are working on the courses they manage. 
Um, and so they are actually archiving some that are older than five years old um, that are still on this list. So I'm going to get with them and make sure we have the most recent list out there. And then those of you that staff that always went to the RT3NC.org site, that was NCVPS's site for their DPI courses that they built out and it broke. There was a lot of blank pages. So they've created a new site. So there's the link at the bottom there. Um, please do go out there and see the courses that NCVPS manages um, that are DPI um, for your staff across the state. And anytime you go to either one of those lists, you still do have to come back to NESIS and search for the course and sign up for it in NESIS. This um, issue is ongoing. Um, when you go into, when you are a district administrator and you want to set somebody else to be a district administrator, it is coming up with a status 500 error message. It does still seem to process overnight. Make sure you do all the steps that are listed in the district administrator help guide that I have here. And um, so here's your help guide link right here. And it's on page three. You, you have to set their district administrator rights and you have to set their district administrator location. If it still doesn't work, open a ticket and I'll set it. And that seems to be working for the to them process overnight. And if it doesn't, we'll get it up to our school. But there is a ticket already out there for this issue. They've had this a couple of years ago, they said. Um, they've seen it. So it's related to what they saw a couple of years ago and they've escalated it on up to try to get this fixed just as soon as possible. And then also around the same time, um, site administrators lost the ability in my staff to open people's profiles. It was giving them a message that no privileges to access user accounts was found. And when they fixed it, it then gave them access, which they've not had access to before the user accounts page. So Dr. Sox and I thoroughly looked at what they see on the user accounts page. Um, and they, they see the view profile they can view people's courses and they can view transcripts, all of which they could previously go to staff dashboards and also see. So we said that's okay. So we told them to go ahead and put the fix in. We've asked them for a root cause on why that broke in the first place. And when we hear about what the root cause actually was, we'll get that communicated out. If you need training accounts right now, these are available through the end of the year. Once end of year happens, of course, we have to update our training site as well. So, but if you need to be making um, help guides or anything and need training accounts to use, um, there's your links right there to the training site. You're gonna need um, the username to sign in with. So down at the bottom is a link to a spreadsheet that I've created. And you have a group of a district administrator, a site administrator, and then three or four teachers. Uh, and so you can sign in with any of those and get um, get what you need to get from the training site so that you're not showing any personal information. This is end of year. So this is no longer tentative, so cross that out. It is going to be Wednesday, June 30th, 2021, after 5 p.m. But we are still working with the vendor to determine date the date that we're going to this just doesn't really go down. We just archive the plans and you no longer can edit archive plans. Um, but we do have to target the new plans. So until you have access to those targeted plans, no 21-22 plan types can be set. So we're going to work on what day that that will happen and we'll get that communicated out to you. Um, what districts are working on right now, you should be confirming your staff lists are accurate deleting and archiving any unnecessary evaluation plans, and then confirming your evaluation and PDP plans are completed, please, prior to 6.30. On 6.30, I have to go run a report for EVOS, and that's the standard ratings reports. So I'll be running those at the close of business on 6.30 and then notifying the vendor, it's okay to go ahead and archive the plans. If you need to update anything and then run reports. Remember, some of those updates, especially demographic updates, have to process overnight, so time that out. I know some of our bigger districts are actually completing this month right now with all their plans, and then they have time to run any reports that they need. It's best to run reports during the current year. 
because during next year, if you want to pull school locations where they were at the time that that rating happened, if they've moved to new locations or changed their name or changed their plan type, if you run a past report for ratings and then include those fields, you're going to get the current year fields for those demographic fields. So run your reports this year. All right, and then currently I'm testing the 2021-22 plans and we'll get those okay to be implemented after EOI and also working with the vendor on our EOI task items. Any questions about end of year? We did have a couple of comments on the people that registered that they wanted a little bit of information on end of year. We thoroughly went over this at HPMU in February and it was recorded. And if you need those links to that, um, let me know. I'll get those out to you. And, the, and we had webinars on the end of year activity as well. So here's what must be locked to open up those summative containers. And I'll let you look at that. Any questions about that? Summatives don't open until each of these activities are done specific to the plan type. And again, a reminder to run those EOI reports. Um, in the past, we've had to activate any inactive staff that are still connected to your district when you run an end of your report. I'm gonna talk to the vendor about that again to see if check our quick reports to see if they would pull inactive staff that are still connected to you. But once they're no longer connected to you, you can't pull reports on them. So make sure when they leave that you're saving hard copies that you might need for the summer or for superintendent's request later. And then work with your payroll to possibly leave staff that are not going to another district active until June 30th and until you get your reports done. And then also work with payroll to not activate any new next year staff until after July 1, 2021, or they show up in this year's rosters and NACES, if you do it before then. Here's a link to the admin reporting that we did for this year. So if you need some more information on how to pull reports, there's your webinar. And let me see if Sean is here. I don't see him in the list. Sean, if you're here, please unmute. Check my email. Give me just one minute, please. I do have an email. Oh, let me get the link for Sean. He said, I thought I put in bad in him. Let's see. I'm going to mute just a minute. Let me get that link for Sean. Sorry guys, my our computer is being very slow.
Hey, we're wrong. If you have a link to our session, I'm trying to send it. Maybe it just went to Sean. 10-4, I'll look for it. I think it just went. So I'm going to go over a few slides until Sean can join us. I apologize for that. I didn't realize he couldn't join. So while we're waiting for Sean. And Cammy, I just sent it to him again as well. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So some of your networking um, items, and if you guys want to meet during this, please do. And Sean will be here in just a minute, hopefully. Um, the TNL to HRMS credit process. So this is where people earn credits in NISAs, or you've entered credits for the transfer credit manager. Um, credits are transferred from NISAs, and it used to be known as True North Logic TNL, and to HRMS daily. Somebody in your district, if you're an HRMS district, needs to reconcile that. So whatever comes over from um, NISAs to HRMS, those credits, for it to show up for staff on their HRMS transcript, you need to have reconciled it and approved it to show up. Um, so the how-to is found on the HRMS site, and I've linked that on the right there with the graphic. And then we currently have two cases open with Power School Support. Um, everything else seems to be working good. Let us know if for your district, if it's not, because we have been working closely with a few districts this year on the process. Now, the credits that are earned by courses seem to be working good now. Um, the ones that are entered to the transfer credit manager, we've seen some issues. So it shows duplicates for transfer credit manager entries that have the same date. So transfer credit manager entries don't have unique course codes. So when it sees entries on the same date, it thinks it's a duplicate. So the best way to handle that, there are different ways to reconcile the credits that come over, and you can see that in the help. You can do it by person, by course by um, different ways to edit that leave editing the duplicates or reconciling your duplicates to the very last step that you do and and then um, we have also requested some updates to that so if it looks like a duplicate it doesn't always let you approve it it lets you either ignore it or replace what it thinks is a duplicate with we're asking the vendor to please look at that and give you the option to add it if it's not a true duplicate. And then the second issue is also in the courses. This was on one of those courses, either transfer credit manager, or if you've created a course um, that has four sections in it and somebody needs to take all four sections. So this was also thinking that this was a duplicate and it was only bringing in one of the credits. So, so they were supposed to earn one credit and you had to add it up as 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. It was only bringing in one of the 0.25s. So we are also working with the vendor and they have escalated that issue as well. So if anybody else is having issues with uh, this transfer credit process, please let us know. All right, and we'll leave this one. I see Sean's here. So sorry about that, Sean. I didn't realize you had the invitation. Let me make you present him. No worries. Thank you. All right, how are you all today? Doing good. I hope you're doing good. Doing well. Thank you. Right, let's make sure everything, it's been a while since I've used WebEx. Are you able to see my screen there? Yes. All right. So, um, let me, I'm going to jump right in. So, Cammy asked me to come in and work with you all and show you three different things. She wanted to talk about kind of end of the year stuff. And with a primary focus in um, talking about staff groups, the staff dashboard, and then reporting for the summative eval. We can put the camera down here a little bit. Um, so I'm going to start, I'm going to go in that order. I'm going to start out with staff groups. We're going to talk about the purpose of those and how to build those out. And then from there, we will go into the staff dashboard. 
and what you can see in there as well as um, you know how you can use things like staff groups in order to drive that. And then we'll talk about that summative eval um, piece as we're, we're going in. So, uh, Cammy, any other direction you want me to go or are we ready to just jump in? Please jump in, Sean. All right, let's do it. All right, so we're going to start here with staff groups. And where I am is I'm in system administration, and then I just go to staff groups, which for me is the third option down. It's probably the same for you all as well. Within staff groups, what I'm going to see is a list of any staff group that I have access to, which may be nothing or it may be a couple of things, as well as the create staff group button right up here in the upper right. Now, I'm going to come in to just create a staff group. And we're going to talk about the couple of different options that, that happen here. Now, where create staff group or staff groups as a whole is really, really beneficial is in areas where you want the system to dynamically create a group or you have a group that you want to create that is not part of the job codes and demographics and sites that exist currently. So currently, you know, you can go in and you can say, I need to see my my different staff groups, I can see my different thing, you know, different people and locations and stuff like that. But you can't very easily see, you know, maybe like your newest teachers, or maybe if you're, you know, you have a, a principal that wants to see teachers that they're concerned about, you know, I want to be able to group my, my teachers that I'm concerned about. You could create staff groups in that way. Now, once you create a staff group, you have your option up here to change the title. So you can change it to whatever you would like. And then I'm actually going to do um, something specific on this one. I'm going to call this one instructors. Um, and you'll see why I call that, that here in a second. Um, next, I'm going to come down here to the bottom. Now, I have three different ways to add people into a staff group. Now, the most obvious ways are right here with add members. Now, for those of you that use the system for professional learning, add user and add user advanced is exactly the same as add learner and add learner advanced. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with that part of the system, from a very basic concept, add user gives me the ability to just search people by name. So I can come right up here and I can just search their name and then I can add people. If I can add them, you know, in multiples and I can even do filters if I want to be able to look at, you know, like a title. So I want to add everybody in a title, uh, but I can just add people in like that. I click add and it adds them into my staff group down here at the bottom. Now, a good note to call out before I talk about the other two ways here is these people that I just added, these five people I just added, they don't know they've been added to a staff group because the primary purpose of staff groups is reporting. And I'll share that kind of what that looks like here in a minute. So they're going to know or they're not going to know in any way, shape or form that they were added to this staff group. That's just kind of good to call out in the sense that, you know, if maybe you're doing a. Uh, teachers at risk staff group, and you don't want them to know that they're at risk yet. Um, this is a safe way to do this where you have access to it. You're the only one that has access to it. It's not something anybody else is going to see. Next up is add user advanced. Now, add user advanced gives you the ability to be able to add individuals to your staff group by email address, employee ID, or username. So you can use any of these that you have. And they have to be the, the ones that are in Nesis in order for you to use those. Now, very simply, you just choose which identifier you're going to use, how they're separated. So like if you're going to do a, if you have a list of emails in Excel, you're going to copy those over. It's probably going to be new line separated. So you can go and put that in. If it's an email list that you're pulling out of something like Outlook, I know Outlook does semicolon separation. So I would just choose other, tap in that semicolon and put that there. And then you're just going to paste in your, your fields here, your actual identifiers. And then once you get that all done, you're going to click on the next button up here. Sorry, my screen's dancing around on me. Click the next button in the upper right. It's going to give you a preview. It's going to highlight anybody who did not get identified, who doesn't match. And then uh, you can click next and it just adds them right in. Now, the message I'm supposed to give is that this can be, at, be used to add about a thousand people at a time. Um, I have actually figured out that depending on how long the email addresses are or the employee IDs, whatever it is you're using, that you can actually add up to four to five thousand at a time. Um, when we originally came up with it, it's actually a character limit that's in this box down here. And when we originally came up with that count, we did an average and what we assumed was the old traditional email addresses that we all had as teachers. You know, for me, it would have been like Sean dot there at 
you know, ccsd.co.k12.us, the real long one. And I know some of you still have those. Though, if you have the real long email addresses and that's what you're using, you probably are going to be limited to the thousand. If you have the shorter email addresses, so I know um, as I was teaching, mine got shortened to ccsd.org and or edu. And at that point, you know, that, that means you can add in a lot more. Or if you're using employee IDs and they're significantly shorter, um, you can do that as well. So, Hey, Sean, yeah, I have a question. Um, Sally's asking if you create a staff group, do you have to re recreate it each year? So it depends on how you add people in. So, so let's use one that's like a really obvious of new teachers. So I come in and I create a new teacher staff group. Um, if I, if the way I add them in is either by using this feature right here or by using the add user that we just talked about a second ago, then yes, I'd have to, I don't know if I'd necessarily say I have to recreate it as much as repopulate it. So the staff groups don't get wiped out, but if I go in and I use email addresses to populate all of my district's new teachers for the year, I'm gonna need next year to add in all of the new teachers again. So you'll have to recreate it in that sense if you're using either of these two. Good question. And then you can choose, you know, what makes the most sense. And I know Cami and I have talked about this one in the past. What makes the most sense to create a whole new staff group and start over with my, you know, 21, 22 school uh, new teachers or to just wipe out the old ones and uh, or wipe out the old people in the staff group and do that. And I'll talk about why you would do one versus the other here in just a minute. Now, to go along that same line, though, is the dynamic rule. Now, dynamic rule, if you're able to use the dynamic rule feature, then the dynamic rule means that you won't have to recreate this every single year because the system is going to make sure that the people who are in the list are the appropriate people at that given time. So at the time, you know, of whenever you're looking at the staff group. And so you can see here that I can use any of these features up here. So I can do sites, I can do demographics, I can do the admin type, which is like site admin, user, district admin. Um, I can do current staff position, which is just the same as demographics. It's just that top level. I can do role. This is a really unique one I'm going to talk about in just a second. And I can do custom fields, which are really any of the profile fields. And I can filter by any of those profile fields. Now, if we use, I'm going to make sure I have something here. Uh, maybe. Um, so if we use something like, you know, the, the enroll date, which is the date that they were added into Nesis, which may or may not be a, an accurate date for new teachers. Um, if we use any of these fields, we can do that. So actually, let's use like teacher plan type. So teacher plan type. There we go. Make sure I'm looking at the right way. Um, teacher plan type. These are all of those different plan types. So let's say that I create this based off of anybody who is a teacher abbreviated. And I want to see people, so let me, I'm going to be specific. I'm going to say I want to see teacher abbreviated, but I only want to see them in, let's pick a specific district, let's say Camden. Um, now, I don't think I actually did, there we go, Camden County Schools. So now, when I choose this, it's going to populate it with everybody in Camden County Schools that has a teacher abbreviated plan. Now, to answer the question of would I have to redo this next year, no, because next year, this list is going to adjust. So everybody who was on an abbreviated plan this year that is no longer on an abbreviated plan is going to get removed. And everybody who joins an abbreviated plan next year, who should be on an abbreviated plan next year, is going to get added. So because I'm doing the dynamic grouping here, this is going to allow me to be able to keep this playlist year in and year out and only have it populate with the people who matter in that perspective. All right, now I'm going to come up here. I'm just going to turn on the test part of it here quickly. Because one piece I want to show, so I'm going to add, and I want to kind of showcase two different searches. And I am going to talk about that roles feature here in a minute as well. It's really going to be important for the professional learning people, not so much for uh, those of you that aren't using professional learning. So I'm going to add this in. It's probably going to take a second because there's probably quite a few people. I didn't think about that part of it. But while, while that's loading, I can talk about, so you can see that I chose two different boxes here. I chose site and I chose the custom, the custom group or custom profile. 
And what the way those are going to work is that those are going to work as and statements. And what I mean by that is, is that the only people who are going to be added to my staff group are people who are in NC test and are teacher abbreviated. So I'm only going to see those individuals in that direction versus if I came back in, so you can see I've got my little box right here. Now I'm going to come back in and I'm going to do add dynamic rule again. And this time I am going to use, uh, let's use admin type. And I'm going to say, I just want to see super users. And now at this point, you're going to see, I'm going to get a second box. And that second box is now going to work like an or statement. And what that means for those of you that aren't, aren't familiar with that terminology, because it is weird, it's backwards, is that not only am I going to get, I'm going to have a list that has all of my NC test teacher abbreviated, or I'm going to get all of my super users. So I'm going to get them all. I always visualize this like shopping on Amazon, that if I go and I start searching for shoes, then I'm going to have my brands all together. And when I search for Nike and Reebok, that is an or statement. I want to see Nikes or Reebok, so I'm going to get them all. Versus if I say Nike size 10, that's going to be an and statement. So I'm only going to see my Nikes and size 10s together. So in this scenario, I'm going to get everybody who is NC test as teacher abbreviated, as well as everybody who is a super user. Now, the reason I wanted to showcase this, though, is this little include box. I actually have the ability, because I chose two separate things, I have the ability to say I want to exclude somebody. So in this scenario, I want to see everybody who's an NC test who has an abbreviated plan, but I don't want to see them if they're a super user. I don't want them to be part of the group if they're a super user. And so it's going to repopulate here in a second, and you'll notice that the excluded option here that I just added in is going to turn red once it loads here. It's going to turn red to really note, signify to me that it is a uh, that it is a an exclusion rather than anything else. In addition to that, right up here on the top of the list, you'll notice that people are going to be crossed out. So anybody who does fit that exclusion, it's still going to show me that person but it's going to cross them out. Let's see if I got anybody here. I am. I, I'm in the person that falls into that line. I'm power school administrator. And so you can see that I'm crossed out right there. Now, the reason we did that was because of the fact that we want to make sure that you're aware of why somebody maybe isn't on your list. So for example, let's say that you are, you know, somehow you are in charge of my evaluation. You want to come in and verify that I'm in the staff group, but I'm not there. You can come search for me by name right here. You just come in and search for power school. And when you search for me, it shows here I am, but I'm crossed out. And by me being crossed out, you now know why I'm not part of that group. Now, if you need me to be part of that group, you can just come over here and say, you know what, include them. And now it's going to include me in the group and it's going to give me a little broken chain because it's basically telling you that I am breaking the link up here by having done what I just did. So a couple of little options for what you need to do or what you can do there um, for what you're looking at. Now, the one piece that I, I kind of teased a little bit, and this is really for those of you that are using the professional learning side of the system, is that idea under dynamic role where you can choose the role, under dynamic rule where you can choose the role. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to create a staff group of people based on professional learning roles. Let me come back in here and you can see the whole list. And what that role allows you to do is you can pick people who are course creators. So I have this whole list over here of all these roles. So I can say, you know what, I need to see instructors or I need to see, I think course creators a little further down here. Let's say skip them. There they are, course requesters. I need to see course requesters or any of these additional little roles I have, you know, people who can create PD playlists. I know I've shared PD playlists with you all in the past. Um, so different pieces that you can come and you can pick and choose. Now what's kind of nice about this, and Cami, this is maybe big for you in particular, is that you can actually get a list of the people who are in this, in this role um, just in your district. So if you really need to identify in your district who are my course creators? You can choose course requester and then choose site, pick your district, and you're going to get a list of who are the people who are course creators in your district. Um, you know, a lot of times that could be you need to update them, you need to adjust them, you just need to see who you need to reach out to, all of those kind of things. So I really like that feature, especially, or not especially, but primarily for those professional learning pieces.
Yeah, I like that because then in your list, you can always download a CSV, right? Yes. Yeah, it's a great line. Yeah, close this window out here. Yeah, so right here in the upper right corner, I can download CSV, and that's going to pull the exact table that we're looking at right here um, out into Excel, and then you can do whatever you want to with it. Now, to, to kind of loop back around to the question of, of, do you need to create a new one every year? Now, I think it really depends what you're trying to do with it. Now, if all you're doing is reporting, which I told you is the primary purpose of staff groups, then it's kind of up to you. I would say, honestly, it's a hit or miss on whether you feel like you need to update them every year or not. Um, personally, I think if you're using the ad user features to be able to do it, it actually makes a little bit more sense for you to recreate it every year. So to have a 2021 new teacher, a 2122 new teacher, and so on, or whatever your group is. And the reason I say that is in order to remove them, if you manually do it, the only thing you can do is click the X. There's not a way to bulk. Um, remove them all. You can actually create uh, delete the staff group so that that way, you know, it goes away. I'm never going to need to see this one again, but I need a new one. Um, it just makes a little bit more sense to just start from scratch rather than deleting everything and then re adding. But the circumstance in which that doesn't make sense is if you are using the staff group for course targeting. Now, again, this is only for professional learning people, but with course targeting, if you create this group, I'm going to come up here to details and permissions, and there's two things that you can do in here, and I'll share them both. But to start with is right here, can be used for course targeting. If I check this box, then anybody who creates a course, when they go to the required, recommended, restricted option, they will see a little tab at the top that says user groups. And that then allows them to be able to target a course to this group. Now, a couple of recommendations. First of all, if you are going to create a course for course targeting, be very, very, or create a staff group for course targeting, be very specific in your title of who you are, who these people are. And what I mean by that is if I just say instructors, but really these are just the instructors of Buncombe County, then this is going to show up for everybody who can create a course as instructors. They can't see the individuals, but they can choose it as a course targeting. And if I just see instructors, that's maybe going to be a little confusing. So I would call this, you know, instructors, Buncombe County. I maybe misspelled that. Well, apologies if I did, um, but the uh, you can really see, you know, I can see it very clearly exactly what I'm looking at in that perspective by naming it out. Second thing that I would really call out if you're going to use it for course targeting is do not make this a sensitive group. So if this is a teachers who are at risk, I would not use it now. I'll be very clear. I'm kind of a paranoid person when it comes to stuff. And the, to be very honest, like if I call this, you know, teachers who are at risk, Wake County or whatever I want to call it, and I then put it out there for course targeting, the only thing people will be able to easily see is the title. They won't be able to see the people that are in it. They won't be able to see anything else. But where I get a little concerned is if I go and I recommend that that group to a course, and then people start registering for that course, I now know who those people are. Um, so I have an, an idea of what it is. So I get a little concerned in that scenario when it comes to any kind of sensitive grouping. Um, so I usually keep this one to, you know, if it's like new teachers or if there's another group, like I have a district who uses it to do all their uh, grade levels, say like a first grade, second grade, third grade, and they use the, the staff groups for that. You know, and those, those aren't super sensitive kinds of information. Now, the other thing you, oh, actually, before I go there, the, to answer the full question of should you recreate it every year? So let's use new teachers as a good example. So I go in, I create a group of new teachers. I use this to target courses. So here are the courses that are gonna be in NISAs for my district specifically that I want people to be able to, to I, I need people to take as new teachers. I target it, I send that out. Now, if next year I create a new staff group, I then have to go back into each of those courses and retarget them to the new staff group versus if I just use the same staff group, delete all of the new teachers and add in all of the new ones or even just add in the new ones. Maybe I'm fine with it being a running list for a while. 
um, at that point, the targeting stays the same. So it'll just shift. So if I was a new teacher in 2021, I see all of those courses because I was on the list. Tammy's going to be a new teacher in 21, 22. You go and just add her onto the list. It automatically just adds her into the targeting. So she's automatically going to get new recommended required courses um, just based off of that targeting. So that's the one scenario where I would say it doesn't make sense to create a new staff group um, for you know continuing years, year after year after year. But it's only for that professional learning part. Now, the other part on this page to kind of go over is the permissions area over here. And what permissions area does is it allows me to be able to share this staff group with somebody else. So right now I see the staff group. Cami doesn't see this staff group yet. So I could come right over here to the little drop down. I could say add a user. And I can then search for somebody. And when I search for Cami. There she is. I can just say, go ahead and add her. And now I have given Cami access to this staff group. She has the ability to now come in and add people, change the targeting, change all of those kind of details within this. Now, in addition to that, if Cami accessed this staff group, she would see right up here where it says owner power school administrator. She would see my name because she would, you know, I was one who created it. But there'd actually be a little button right here that says, I think it says like change to me or something like that. And basically what that does is it gives Cami the ability to fully take this staff group. I would still be added in as a permissions person, um, but it gives her that ability. Where I really like that is if there is that scenario where I'm going to create the staff group, but then I really need to pass it off to Cami and just let her take it for the rest of time. Um, she could go in, take it over, and then delete me as permissions, and then I don't have to worry about it anymore. So I did the work to build it and then pass it off to her to be able to maintain it. So that's just kind of an option that you can do that you can do with the staff group. All right, so that's kind of staff groups in a really, really, really big nutshell. Um, any questions on staff groups before we go into the staff dashboard? I don't see any in the chat right now, Sean. All right, thank you. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the staff dashboard. Staff dashboard is probably my absolute favorite area. Um, this is the staff dashboard right here. Now, to get there, it should be the second option on your list. So you should see user accounts and then staff dashboards. And within the staff dashboard, you're going to see this little area right here. Now, you're going to populate, you're going to use the staff dashboard from left to right. So you're going to start out here with the um, how you're going to choose your users. And then the middle column right underneath where it says group by site, this is actually going to be your list of users. And then you're going to do your actual dashboard over here. Now, to start out with, you have four different ways that you can use to choose who you're looking at. I'm starting here with the bottom one, staff groups. So any of your staff groups that you have saved, now you're only going to see the ones that you have saved, um, but you can actually see all of the different staff groups and you can come down. So my instructor one, I, I probably didn't save it fully. Um, but it would be in this list, and then you could just come in and click on that. So I'll click on Sean Sample. Which had real people in it. Wow. Um, so once I pick that, you can then see that I have my people over here. In addition to that, I can narrow it down by search staff. This just allows me to be able to search any of that profile information. Now, I do like search staff if I want to use sites and demographics in combination with each other. Now, you are automatically going to be limited by your own group anyway. So if you are the district admin of a specific county, you will not be able to see or of a district, you will not be able to see anybody outside of that district anyway. So you don't need to worry about filtering by site and demographic if what you're hoping to see is every teacher in a specific district. Um, for those of you that are district admin, though, what will be helpful here is if you want to see specific individuals at a specific school. So if you're looking just for teachers at a school, then you're going to want to come to search staff so you can do site and demographic in combination with each other. Now, if you just want to see people in a specific demographic, you can just open that up and then you all have this. And I'm sure you're probably pretty familiar with this one. So you can open it up and you can see, you know, exactly where everybody is. Um, you can pick whatever roles you want. You can pick multiple roles if you choose to. It's whatever you would like in this scenario. Or you can go by site. Now, one kind of piece that's important to call out here is the first one you'll always see is all my sites. Whatever, if you check that, it's going to allow you to see whatever you have access to. 
So again, if you're the district admin of a specific district, when you check all my all my sites, you're going to see your district. If you're a principal and you check all my sites, you're going to see your school. If Cami goes and checks all my sites, she's going to see the entire state. Um, she's going to see absolutely everybody. You also then have the ability to come in here and narrow it down. So I'm going to come narrow it down to region two. We're going to go to Brunswick and even within Brunswick County, I can come in and I can pick a specific school if I want to. So I could narrow that all the way down. Now, to reiterate what I just said, if I'm the principal of Belleville Elementary, all I'm going to see is Belleville Element Elementary. I'm going to see the same drop downs, but by the time I get down here, that's the only choice I'm going to have. And I'm not going to have any other choices to go anywhere else. And if I click all my site, I'm only all my sites. I'm only going to see Belleville. If I am a district admin at Brunswick, I'm going to be able to see everything down to Brunswick. I'm not going to have all these other options, but I'm going to see everything down to Brunswick. And then when I open this up, I'm going to see every school because I'm a district admin. And then again, as Cami, I see it all. So I see absolutely and totally everything on the list. Now I'm going to go ahead and pick one of these. I'm going to pick something in the test here. Let that load for a second. Oh, no results found. That's not helpful. Um, the training site might be um, better, Sean. One of these. I'm trying to think which one. I don't We're want down to at the bottom of the training. Which one? Training at the very bottom. Oh, down here. Got it. Try that. There we go. There's some people. Yeah, I don't want to show any PII, but. Can you expand it out? Yeah. Get rid of this checkbox here. Training district, maybe. School one. What has names? <laughs> Trying to find those all those fake. It users. probably still has names. Um, the training schools, but we could um search. Yeah. Uh, the users maybe. I'll do that. I'll just search for the word training. All right. So you get the idea here. Uh, let me come to search staff and I am going to just search for people with the, the first name, wouldn't it, Kimmy? Yes. This is probably going to take a user might, PD user might report this. If that doesn't bring anybody. Didn't like that one. Oh, it's not like any of my choices. <laughs> Try last name PD user. Is that one word? PD user? Yeah. There we go. I got some. All right. So you can see here, I've got my list here in the middle. Um, one piece I'll call out before I go any further is you'll notice right up here at the top is this option of including inactive users. So users who are, are inactive in the system will not automatically be included in this list. If I want to include them, because maybe I'm looking at data from last year and I want to make sure I'm looking at full data from last year, all I have to do is click the little checkbox and it gives me that ability to be able to um, include those inactive users. Now, very quickly going right across the line um, so I can see my list of people. I'm going to start right here with the group dashboard. Um, so the group dashboard gives me a couple of options for professional learning. I can see when people are registering for courses. So maybe if I want to be able to create some district stuff and I want to make sure I'm not interfering with stuff that's in Nesis, um, I can do that. The one I like more, though, especially for evaluation and PD is the portal option. This gives me a visibility of when people have been logging in. So I can come in and I can see when people have logged in. So these six users, there was a big peak in June where they logged in a whole bunch of times. Um, and I can see, you know, when was the last time they logged in? So about half of them logged in in the last one to three months. Um, about well, one of them logged in in the last uh, 14 days. And then we've got one that hasn't logged in for more than a year and one that logged in three months to half a year. So it gives me a visibility to be able to see kind of where everybody is. What you really don't want to see is the pink. That's the one that's a little tricky there is anybody who's never logged into the system would be somebody that I would call out as a concern. Um, but it gives you kind of a call out there. Now, what's additionally really nice is let's say that I really want to figure out which of these people hasn't logged in for more than a year. I can click on this little chart icon here to the right. 
and it's going to give me a list of every single one of the people that I've chosen over here. So my six users, and it's going to tell me when they logged in last. So here's my list and I can see, okay, well, PD user one was the one who logged in in the last two weeks. PD user test was the one who has not logged in for more than a year. So at this point I can go in and I can identify who those individuals are and be able to figure out what I need to do to help those individuals. So maybe if I'm trying to look at evaluation data and I want to be able to see, you know, who hasn't logged in to do their part, who hasn't logged in to do their professional development plan or any of those kind of stuff, I can come in and I can identify that um, just directly from here to be able to see maybe why they're not doing it. You know, if I go in and look at my my evaluation data and I see that Cami hasn't finished her part of a plan, I could come in here and see what's the issue. Is it that Cami just hasn't done it, or is it that Cami doesn't know her login info or something like that, and be able to then help her out in that direction. Um, next up is I can come here to group reports. Um, group reports give me some basic summary data of the um, different evaluation plans that are associated to these. Now, some of this, I know, Cami, you and I have worked in the past on making sure that this is showing correct. So I think some of it's still a little bit wonky, right? Yeah, I don't um, really recommend these reports yet because we still haven't got them fully working. Okay. So these coming soon, you'll be able to use these again. We'll, we'll be able to get that taken care of. Um, now, moving further along, uh, the rest of this I will call out for the most part is, is professional learning stuff. There is one evaluation piece I'll call out here in a little bit. Um, so for individual information, I'm going to start by clicking on the name of a person. So I've got my list here, but I really want to look at PD user test because they're the one who hasn't logged in in a while. So I can see here when did they last log in. I can see their email address, what site they're located at, what demographics they have, if any. I can also come in and see what learning opportunities are they part of. And by part of, it could be that they're registered for it, but haven't completed it. It could be that they've completed it. It could be any of that. I can also come in and look at their transcript. So I can see their transcript from right here. Now, there's a, a different way that I would access the transcript usually, but if I'm here already, especially if maybe this is a staff group I'm looking at or something like that, this is a really nice place to be able to come in and look at that transcript. And then I can also look at plans evaluation. So again, I would normally access somebody's plans evaluations through either staff evaluations or my staff, uh, but this is a, another way to access that plan if I'm already here. So I'm already looking at my staff group. I'm going to come in and I'm going to access that plan evaluation. Um, I can do that right from here. And then finally is course completion reporting. Now, for those of you that have not, or that those of you that use the professional learning and have used ad hoc, the one kind of lacking area in ad hoc reporting is that if somebody is not on a roster, they won't show up in ad hoc reporting. So if I've got something in the system that I need to make sure that everybody has taken, so everybody in a specific group or everybody in my school or everybody in my district or whatever has taken, I cannot use ad hoc reporting to identify who has not registered. So let, let's keep it really concrete here. Let's say I, I need to verify who's taken bloodborne pathogens. And here are my six people right here. Now, if I go in and run a report to say I need to see everybody in my school who has who has taken or not taken bloodborne pathogens. Well, let's say that that users two through six have registered and or completed. They're going to show up on my ad hoc report. User one, my little troublemaker here, PD user. They have not even registered for this course. They haven't even registered for it. They're not going to show up in ad hoc because ad hoc reporting is only pulling the info from the um, it's pulling the info from the roster itself. Now, this report runs in a different direction. So it's already starting with my list of users. Here are my six users that I want to look at. Now I can come over here and I can put in a course number. I can put in a course title. I can put in dates and sections I want to look at. And then here's the part I really like is that then I can look at who has completed a section of this course, who has registered for this course, but not completed. So this is going to be anybody who's registered and complete any of those others. And then also who has not even registered. So in this scenario, I could see a test PD user hasn't even registered for a section of this course. And it's just going to pop right up as not registered. So, for example, if I was going to look at bloodborne pathogens, you know, really at this point, I don't care who has completed it. So I'm going to uncheck that. I need to see if these six people up here who has it, who is registered and hasn't completed it or who just hasn't even registered for it. So I can make sure that they get those compliance courses taken care of. Now, I have two options to look at this. I can look at it from a summary perspective, which is going to give me a site by site 
percentage. Now, in this case, I think I was just looking at one site. Um, and so in this case, I would only get one line and it would say of this line of people, this percentage have completed it, this percentage have registered, this percentage have not registered. Um, if Cami went in to go look at like a statewide compliance course, she would see it state by, or, uh, site by site and she would be able to verify exactly where everybody was. As district admin, you would be able to see that as well. You could go in and look and see what percentage has completed everything. Or I could look at details, and details is going to give me line by line. So it's going to say PD user test not completed, PD user tests or not registered, PD user one registered, PD user two completed, and it's going to give me a line by line so that then I can go in and verify who has completed whatever it is that I'm asking them to have completed in each line. Now, one piece I will call out here too is that you can actually use more than one course. So if you have course one, two, three, four, five, and course two, three, four, five, six that you want to look at, you can just comma separate them right here. And then what you're going to get is you're going to get two lines. So it's going to say for course one, two, three, four, five, what is PD users roster status? For course two, three, four, five, six, what is PD users roster status? And then it'll give PD user one both lines, PD user two both lines, and so on and so forth. It's a really nice field for those, a really nice report for those people that are using professional learning and need to be able to verify, you know, what you're looking at in each scenario. All right, now, Cami, I want to make sure I'm given enough time here. Uh, how much longer do you want me to be able to go? You're still good. Go ahead. Okay, cool. You're, you're going to do ad hoc reporting, right? Okay, yep, that's where I was going to go next. Um, so, any questions on staff dashboard? I don't see any questions in the chat. Anybody need to unmute and ask a question? I think we're good, Sean. All right. Um, so now we're going to look at the summary data for um, the summative. So reporting on your summative. Now, there's a couple of things that, that we can look at in order to run a report. So here I am. I'm looking at an evaluation plan. I think I'm looking at an abbreviated one. Um, so I'm looking at an abbrevi abbreviated evaluation. And what I'm going to look down here is in the summary evaluation. And you can see that I have three different types of activities. And what that means is I can actually run four different types of reports here. And I'll explain where the fourth one pops in. Now, what those different things that I can look at are, is I can look at just data from the forms. So if there's data that I want to pull, I want to go in and pull, you know, what written response data did everybody in my district provide? Um, that could be one report. Other report I could run is I could run the forms data, which is actually the same. So I can get all the forms data for any of this in one report. But then I can also get the sign off. So I can get the individual sign off information um, from right here. Those are the two reports that I can get. So the third one is I can get the info from the summary evaluation form. So whatever information I need to be able to get from that summary evaluation form, I can start right here. The fourth piece of info that I can get is I can get the status of each of these things. So now those of you that are checklist people like I am, I know whenever I'm doing anything in the evaluation system, I do everything I can to get my green check mark so I can be all happy and get my green check mark. And that's that fourth report is that I can actually run a report to say, I just need to see what the status is for everybody in my district. Um, so we could use a good example of, I just need to see if at this point, who has not completed their summary evaluation form? You know, who are people that don't have a completed summary evaluation form? I can run that report as well. So where I'm gonna go is I'm gonna come here into ad hoc reporting. And where I start here in this list of reports, where I start is going to be what I'm going to look or what, what I'm going to get in my data. So to start with, I talked about over here how I could get all the data from the forms. If I want to get data from the forms, I want to get a specific question. I want to get series of answers, whatever it is I'm looking at. I'm going to come right down here to evaluation forms. And within evaluation forms, I'm going to go ahead and just click a new report here. The first thing that I want to do is I want to say which plan and am I looking for? Now, this is one piece is that you do have to run this on a plan by plan basis. Currently, there's not a way to do multiple plans. Um, but if I come in and I say, you know what, I want to look at the abbreviated evaluation 2021, which I think is what I was looking at back there. And then once this pre once this populates, there we go. It's going to refresh here. And once it refreshes, now I can actually narrow it down further. So I can say, I only want to look at the summary evaluation. 
and then it'll narrow it down even further. And I can say I only want to look at a specific form. So I can really narrow down that data. And the reason I would do that is because down here, all of the options that I can pick are going to adjust based on what I choose up here. So if I don't choose a group, I have the ability down here to choose every single option of every single form in the abbreviated evaluation, which maybe is gonna be a little too much. I don't wanna get all that info. I just wanna see something specific so I can really narrow it down and I can say, you know what? I only wanna see the stuff that's in that written response optional. I wanna see whoever submitted that. And at this point, as soon as it reloads here, down here on the bottom, it's going to only show me those fields that are specific to that area. So I can see, you know, it narrowed it down. It was a significantly smaller list, but all I can see are the, the specific fields that are here. You know, so I can look at and say, I want to see people who did submit something, but maybe that the principal didn't say they received it or the evaluator didn't say that they've received it. So you can be kind of specific in what you're looking for in the evaluation forms area. And you can do multiple. It just, you're going to have that longer list and you're going to have to kind of pick and choose what you're looking for. Um, I will call out that they populate top to bottom in the same order that they are in the form. I can't change my tab. Hold on. Oh, bars in my way and I can't figure out how to get rid of it. Okay, I, I can't change tabs. There it is. There we go. So it will populate, the form fields will populate in order on ad hoc reporting that they, that they populate here. So for example, if I just say, I wanna see everything in the abbreviated evaluation plan, it's gonna show me all of the locking instruction fields. Then it will show me all the training orientation fields. Then it will show me all of the free observation fields. It's going to show them right in order. So if you're trying to identify what you're looking for, that would be a way to identify where you're where you're seeing everything. <clears throat> now, the next area, I'm just going to come right down the line here. Um, the next area is going to be the evaluation status. Evaluation status is where you can go in and you can identify who has completed, who has their check mark, or who doesn't have their check mark. Now, I'm going to be very clear. I think for those of you that have, have done trainings with me in the past, there's actually three different ways to run this information. So you can run it from here. You can also run it in two different ways from the staff evaluations tab. In the staff evaluations tab, so one, if the specific activity I'm looking for is one of the columns here, so if the column's across the top, so I'm looking for, you know, maybe I want to see the entire summary evaluation container who has or has not completed the entire summary evaluation. I can come right up here to add filter. I can say for summary evaluation, I want to see everybody who's not equal to completed. So I can get that. But in this scenario, it's only the entire container. Second option is I can come right up here to the little squiggle icon and I can come to the evaluation completion report here. And for this one, I can, I don't have it set up for me, um, but I can go in and I can choose specific activities. So I can say for a specific activity, which ones do I want to be able to select? Now, the positive there is that it's visual. It's a very visual representation. It color codes out into a data table and allows you to see it. Or the third way is that I can now come to the evaluation status report right here. And from here, I have the ability to be able to run for specific activities. Now, the positive here is it's going to pull it right out into a data table. You can do whatever you want to with it. So if you need to be able to identify like who and what demographics has not completed this activity, you can do that. You can pivot table it. You can do whatever you want to. I'm just right here from the evaluation status area. Now, the final area, and this is going to be for, open a new tab, here we go. Um, this is going to be for if you're trying to look at this data in particular, the summary evaluation forms data, is that you can come right here to observation or observation single row. Now, I like the observation single row one here more than anything. And the main reason why is that if I have multiple pieces of data for observation, which probably doesn't matter so much for the summary as much as it does for the observations above, is that I can see all of that in one line. So if I go in and want to look at evaluation data for a single person, it's going to concatenate it all to one line. It kind of pivot tables it automatically for you. 
Um, now, within the observation, it's the exact same idea of what we talked about before, except there's one different piece here is that this one's going to be specific to the rubric we're looking at. And so when I come up here to framework, you can see that I've got all of those different rubrics. So I can come in and say, I just want to look at the abbreviated summary evaluation. And when I pick that, it's now going to populate with all of the fields of the abbreviated summary evaluation. And then from there, I can pick and choose the specific fields that I want to look for. So I'm always going to have these up here where I can see the observed last name, the observed name, the observer names. Um, I can see all that info. But then when I come down here, here are the specific fields for that rubric. Now I can choose the rating period so I can make sure I'm only getting people from this school year. And then I can come down the line and I can choose whatever data it is that I'm looking for that pertains to each individual area. Now, one that I will call out here is you'll notice that you've got, um, if I look here at standard one, let me come up a little bit, standard one, that there are four different fields for this. These are gonna be those four different areas that you fill in when you're doing that summary evaluation, um, where you can say, I wanna see what the actual rating's gonna be. I just wanna see the comments, or I just wanna see the recommended actions and resources needed. And I can come in and I can pick and choose exactly what those things are. And Sean, uh, I do that see. by unchecking the boxes on the left, right? To show yes, it. yeah. So uh, the boxes over here on the left, let me actually come up here. So the boxes on the left are the, you know, what fields are going to show up. Little, little user tip from my perspective, the very first thing I always do is double click the select all so that it wipes everything out. Because for me, I only want to choose the data I want to see rather than having to unselect everything. Um, sort is going to allow you, it's just like in Excel, when you go in and say sort by column A, then by column B. We have two columns. You can obviously then pull it into Excel and do more than that. Um, but, you know, if I really just want to sort it by the observed names, I can say sort by observed last name and then by observed first name. So, you know, if I have like five different Williams in my building, it's going to group them by their first name so that all their data is there. Um, filter option is only if you're going to publish it. So if you're a district the district admin that's going to publish your reports out to your your uh, principals, you could use the filter option. And what that means is that when they go to the my ad hoc reports channel, that they'll actually see only the filter options that you chose. Um, so, for example, if I don't check anything in here, when they go there and they click it, it just runs the report and it's going to restrict it by their rights. It's going to do all that kind of stuff. But let's say I want to give them the ability to really narrow it down so that not only can they run a report to see their entire building, but I need to narrow it down because I know Eleanor is coming in for an observation meeting today, and I just want to look at her data and the report quickly. I could add filter option here, and what I'm then going to get is I'm just going to get these two boxes when I click that report from that my ad hoc, my ad hoc reports area. Um, and then finally here, I guess not finally, there is the, the filters over here on the right. So if you want to filter it down, if I want to be able to narrow it down by a specific person or a specific date or anything like that, you know, we talked about with the um, rating period that if I come over here and I narrow it down to a specific rating period, that it gives me that ability to say, you know, I'm only looking for summary evaluation form 2021 and it yeah, can filter down to whatever. But then finally is the graph option. Um, the graph option is only going to work if there are not a significant number of values. Now, you can see that some of these, and my screen's a little hard to see, so yours may be too. Um, some of these are highlighted in pink, and if they're highlighted in pink, that means the system doesn't recommend you use it because there's too many values. So, obviously, things like last name, first name makes sense there that that, that would be there versus framework probably is going to be an okay one because there's not very many values here. It's only going to be one value. Um, the one that would be a little goofy in that scenario, though, is that rating piece down here. So I noticed that it, it for the rating, it actually does have it highlighted, even though I would be willing to bet there's probably not that many unique values here for, for the ratings. So you could check this and um, see. Worst case scenario, it'll pop up and say there's too many values and it won't give you the actual chart. Uh, best case scenario is it will give you the chart itself. Um, I have had a couple of districts that we do this, and it's a it's a chart that's completely unreadable. It's a pie chart that just has so many little slices that it goes all the way through. Um, if you are doing a pie chart or a bar chart, you do want to make sure that you choose the graphical option over here, so that that way when you do that graphical option, uh, it will pull up. I do always like to point out that if you choose a pie chart or a bar chart here, that the graphical option does have a link to allow you to see the raw data report as well. 
Um, so you, if you want to see a graphical for at least one of those, you can see it in both directions. The other thing I really like about the graphical stuff is that it does give you a um, percentage. It gives you a, a table at the bottom that gives you a count and a percentage. So if your question really is, I just want to know the percent of people who are completed, you know, if we're looking at evaluation status report, you can go in there and say, here, you know, here are the percent of people that are completed versus not completed versus in progress and be able to go through each of those steps there. All right, Cammie, any other areas you wanted me to go look at? I think this was great, Sean. Thank you. Um, Good. And I, I saw, I think Cammie sent out a, a more detailed walkthrough of reporting. I think I saw that earlier. If not, I think Cammie has my videos and things like that as well that we can share. Yep, and this is being recorded as well, so we'll share it out. So, unless you guys have any questions, let's see. Eleanor has um, posted a tip. Um, Eleanor says if you if you use sort, filter, or graph, make sure the field is selected on the left box. Um, she says it should be automatically selected, but if it's not, the report will fail. And Sean, this is Brian and Buncombe. You get 100% for spelling Buncombe correctly. Woo! <laughs> I was hoping I did. <laughs> thank you, Brian. Oh, thank you. All right. Anybody else want to unmute and ask Sean a question while we have him today? We have about six minutes left. And we'll get you the feedback link in the chat so you get your certificate for the training for today. Um, but I thought this was awesome. Thank you, Sean. Stop sharing here. All right. Take that back. Okay, we'll go back to the slides. I'm going to put in the chat your feedback link. Well, thank you all so much, and I'll chat with you next time. All right. Thanks, Sean. Bye bye. All right, and let me share my screen again. Let me figure out where to do that. Here we go. All right, so we only have a few minutes left, so and we were at the end of our slides. I did want to give you time to ask any additional questions. Um, we did cover TNL to HRMS. Did anybody have any questions on that? Slide this out of my way. It does get in the way that bar at the top. All right, so we'll go to the next slide. Um, somebody was asking about the reports, which we did cover in February. So here's just a rehash of all the different areas that you can pull reports from. You have your quick reports and definitely run those evaluation completion and evaluation summary reports out of here. And then exporting a plan to PDF. I suggest you do this just as soon as you've completed your plans. This is a, we do have a guide out here and it does include some information on how to um, report out, especially for the summary evaluation. Um, but you do need to give it time to run because the districts, the queue will stack up behind whoever gets to the queue first. So who is ever scheduled on export first, theirs will run first. And if it's a large district, it may take a day or two. Um, so be careful how many people you include because you don't want to include over 5,000 in the report because it will take forever to run. Um, but this is a good way to get those individual reports for summary evaluation in a PDF. Um, so do look at that. Uh, there's the list of the ad hoc reports. I'm going to check that list. I thought I had updated, but I don't think all the um, links for this year are updated. So I'm going to check on that just as soon as we get up on the call today and make sure this ad hoc reports is listed that I have posted to you. Um, now, of course, Sean just showed you how to create your own ad hoc reports. And he showed you staff evaluation in the evaluation completion reports. Any questions about what reports or any comments about what reports to run for end of year before we wrap up? Um, I put the link in the chat. Let me check that link that was on that slide right there because that might need to be updated. I think it's 224 now. Um, most of you should know about our NISA school site. If you're new today, do, and you've never been out to the NISA school site that Dr. Ken Simmons has created, um, and I do um, have some pages out here that I update for you as well, please check that out. 
and we do have the YouTube playlist. So all the webinars that um, are on the system are out here as well for you to go review. And just a quick reminder, if you tweet us out or, or Twitter us out, um, and please do um, go like our Facebook page. We do post the did you knows. I have started a document to archive the did you knows. These are just little tips that we do every Wednesday. Um, don't copy this slide deck over yet. This is in progress. So I've just started it and should have it updated by the end of the week for the archive ones. But every Wednesday we post new did you know moments from each of our home based products. And this is just a quick list of who your contacts are at BPI and for your home based advisory and where you can go find your contact. This list, this page has been updated. You no longer see the map. I like the little spreadsheet that you get to now. So go check out how they've updated the page where you find contacts from other districts. And there you go. Here's your correct link. It is 421 and that should be in your chat. So does anybody else have any other questions or comments for today? If not, we're going to stop the recording in just one more minute. I'll give you time and I will stay on the line before I totally end the session, but I'll stop recording at 12 o'clock. So I hope you've enjoyed today. Thank you guys for all that you're doing. Been a busy couple of years. Unlike any other, thank you, Cami. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ralph.